it's 1912. And what you are seeing is the very first Football World Championship final caught on film. Conventional wisdom has it that England have been world champions just the once, in 1966. But within this unique footage lies the secret of two world championship titles long forgotten. When England beat Denmark in the final of the 1912 Stockholm Olympic football tournament, the world championship was theirs for a second time. In these pre-World Cup days, when the Olympic football tournament was the world's premier competition, England were the original masters, the inventors and the most influential nation in the evolution of the game. The English may have invented the game of football, but much of the early innovation came from Scotland. And it was against the backdrop of the docks and industry on the River Clyde in Glasgow that the first revolution in football happened. At this very first international match between Scotland and England in 1872. Scotland had developed a passing running game through their oldest team, Queen's Park whereas in England they predominantly played a dribbling game where individual skill was the only thing that counted. So you can imagine the culture shock in the first game where an English player would have come up to a Scot and the Scot would have kicked the ball away. And the English players must have thought, what's he doing? So everywhere you go in the world now, you're looking at teams that pass and run. And that game came out of the West of Scotland cricket ground, St Andrew's Day 1872, the Scots invented it. Further south, in the Lancashire conurbation, based around the River Mersey and the port of Liverpool, the Scots were hugely influential in helping popularise the game. The first English champions, Preston North End, were famous for their Scots professors. By the time of this Preston Wolves match in 1905, football had become the entertainment for the working class. Crowds of up to 30,000 were not uncommon. There was nowhere in the world that came close. Understandably, when FIFA had been formed the year before, the British were less than interested. There is, um, in a sense, a cultural and political isolationism, and football is just part of society and reflects society. So the British Empire was at its height when FIFA was founded, so you can imagine the four home nations thinking, well, why should we join FIFA? We invented the game. What on earth could they tell us about how to play the game? But the English were in their hills, they were the most powerful. It was football and the players the best, 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 et que les quali la qualité des joueurs anglais était exceptionnelle à l'époque. Donc euh, les Anglais, euh, dans leur île, ne voulaient pas, ne voulaient pas euh, se mêler au continent européen. League football was the staple diet for supporters, but the allure of watching or playing for your country remained strong. In 1907, with the Scots wearing the rosemary colours of pink and primrose, the annual match was recorded on film for the first time. It was part of the home international championship involving Wales and Ireland, the oldest international tournament, dating back to 1884. In 1908, a second tournament was added to the calendar when football was included as an official sport at the Olympics for the first time in the London Games of that year. Great Britain was represented by the England amateur side, then the equal of the professionals. This England team not only became the first official world champions at the London Olympics, but they also played a pioneering role in the spread of football around Europe. The tours by the English amateurs were fundamental to the development of the game in continental Europe. The central European cities of Prague, Budapest and Vienna were especially favoured destinations. 
In Italy, the English influence was also strong. And at the time of this Italy-France International in 1912, the most important figure in Italian football was a man called Vittorio Pozzo, who had learned about the game while studying in England. Pozzo was the coach of the Italian team at the Stockholm Olympics, where he met an Austrian called Hugo Meissel. Together, they would change the course of football in Europe. Nasce una lite terribile nella federazione italiana gioco calcio, si dimettono tutti, l'Italia era iscritta, allora dicono a Vittorio Pozzo una settimana prima porti la squadra a lei che sa le lingue, capirai, no? mica porti, le... <ride> porti la squadra a lei perché si intende di calcio, porti la squadra a lei che sa le lingue. Erano stati scelti 22 giocatori, c'era già il canonico elenco dei 22, rispondono alla convocazione, pensate, soltanto in 15. At the Stockholm Olympics, Meisel invited an English coach called Jimmy Hogan to Vienna. Hogan was to have a profound effect on football in Central Europe, helping to develop a distinctive style that became known as the Danubian School. In this pre-war amateur era, England remained unrivaled. The Olympic final may have been the World Championship, but the FA Cup final at the old Crystal Palace was still the greatest sporting spectacle on earth. In 1913, a world record crowd of 121,000 came to see the two great club sides of the era, Aston Villa and Sunderland. During his stay in England, Pozzo had been greatly influenced by the passion and the physical nature of the game, which was in contrast to how most Continentals played. He admirava quel, quel tipo di gioco, gioco maschio, vigoroso, però non violento. Il calcio per lui, l'aveva imparato in Inghilterra, il calcio per lui è un moralista, perché permette, permette la forza, ma non la violenza, non l'attacco proditorio, non la frode. It was from the three great cities of Central Europe, Prague, Budapest and Vienna, that the first challenge to Britain as the major European superpower came. With two of the three cities lying on the River Danube, the distinctive and successful style of football that these cities produced took its name from the Great River. Prior to the Great War, all three cities had been united under the Habsburg monarchy, but with different languages and customs, it had never been a happy alliance. On the football pitch, the rivalry was intense. Millions died in the Great War fighting over a small strip of land on the Western Front. But for the peoples of Central Europe, the end of the war saw the whole-scale redrawing of national boundaries. Czechoslovakia, with its capital in Prague, was created as a political entity for the first time, and football became an ever more powerful expression of this nationalist feeling. In 1919, an unofficial Czechoslovakian team took part in the Allied Games at the Pershing Stadium in France, where they beat Belgium, the United States, and Canada on the way to the final. A year later, the Czechoslovaks would lose to host Belgium in the final of the Antwerp Olympics. But here, they beat host France to win the title. Outside of Britain, Prague had one of the most sophisticated club networks on mainland Europe. Sparta Prague had won the affections of the city's working class, while Slavia had attracted the more literary set in the capital. By the mid-1920s, footballers from all over Europe were being enticed to play for them as the two struggled for supremacy before huge crowds. Já sám si pamatuju, že v Budějovicích v jedné hospodě, když Sparta prohrála nebo Slávě prohrála, tak vždycky ta strana, která vyhrála, postavila té druhé straně rakev, 
k tomu svíčky, proto se napsalo prostě zemřela v požehnaném věku AC Sparta nebo SK Slavia. A dokonce se stávalo, že přišel někdy i kněz, aby prostě tomu obřadu smutečnímu dal prostě takový, takovou, takovou, řekněme, aby to opravdu vypadalo jako pohřeb, jako rozloučení smuteční. By the mid 1920s, the idea of a European Cup for clubs was gaining strength, thanks largely to the efforts of Hugo Meisel. In 1927, it became a reality when Sparta Prague met Rapid Vienna in the first final of the Mitropa Cup. The present European Cup may date from 1955, but the very first European champions were not Real Madrid, but Sparta, who won this final. Over the following 12 years, the Metropa Cup captured the imagination of mainland Europe. No, to byla vlastně jediná velká mezinárodní klubová soutěž. Znova opakuji, že to byl vlastně Liga mistrů, pohár mistrů a pohár UEFA, v tom hráli třeba tři až čtyři mužstva z každé země. Pravidelně Itálie, Rakousko, Jugoslávie, Československo, Švýcarsko. Ty hráli úplně pravidelně. Before the river Danube winds its way into Croatia, it passes through Budapest, a city at the heart of football's Danubian legend. Here too, inter-ethnic rivalries help take football to a higher plane. The predominantly Jewish club MTK Budapest won 10 titles in a row between 1914 and 1925, coached by Jimmy Hogan. The Hungarians were famous for their skillful short passing game. In 1928, Ferenc Varos, the club of the German community, won not only the Hungarian Championship and Cup, but also the Mitropa Cup, the first of only six clubs to do the fabled treble of League, Cup, and European Cup. If the heart of the Danubian legend rests in Budapest, then the soul lies 250 kilometers upstream in the city of Vienna. It was here that this legend was born and where it reached its zenith. 1920s Vienna was a hotbed of political intrigue. The Social Democrats of Red Vienna created a sports movement based on the amateur ethic that they hoped would bolster working class solidarity. They were skeptical of big clubs like Rapid, who although working class in origins, played in what the Social Democrats perceived as a bourgeoisie league. They were fighting a losing battle. In 1920, Austria became the first country outside of Britain to accept professionalism, as football became a major spectator sport. Three years later, a crowd estimated that 100,000 watched the Italy-Austria match in Vienna, a continental record that stood until after the Second World War. Football in Central Europe was rapidly approaching the standard of the British Isles. By 1931, it was arguably as good, and the legend of the Austrian wonder team was born that year, after Scotland were beaten 5-0. Anglia, Niemie, uh, Rakousko, Česko, Slovensko a Maďarsko, Ungarn. Tak to byli podle mého názoru tenkrát nejlepší tým, žádný Švédsko nebo tohle, to všechno to neexistovalo. The Wonder Team was the creation of Hugo Meiser, who, as well as running the Austrian Football Association, was the team's coach. Die beiden Kapitäne, der Ungar Sarosi und der Österreicher Naus, begrüßen Sie. From 1931, Austria were beaten just twice in the next three years. And they were unlucky to lose one of those to England in London in 1932. Indeed, that heroic defeat only added to the mystique that grew up around the Wonder Team. Like Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the Austrians relied on sublime skills learnt on the street, shunning the more physical aspects of the game. 
but therein lay its downfall, a downfall that was to test the friendship of Maisel and Pozzo to the limit. If the 1920s had belonged to the Danubian school, then the 1930s were the domain of a nation that lay to the south of the Central European powers, Italy. More than any leader of the time, Mussolini realized the political value of sport. In 1929, Vittorio Pozzo became Italian coach for the third time. Over the course of the next decade, the Italians swept all before them. Il fascismo investe nello sport, investe nella attività fisica, investe nel cercare di creare eh, uomini forti in cui lo sport diventava il podromo della guerra o della possibilità di partecipare a attività più importanti. Pozzo ha usato Mussolini perché il fascismo dava questa dava anche questa carica nazionalista. Però mio padre era un patriota più che un nazionalista. C'è una differenza, eh? Il nazionalista considera nemici gli altri. Il patriota fa tutto il possibile per il proprio paese, però sa che gli altri sa che gli altri hanno il diritto di fare quello che facciamo noi. A competition for the national teams of Europe had been introduced in 1927 at the same time as the Mitropa Cup. The new International Cup, the forerunner of the current European Championship, was also the brainchild of Hugo Meissel. In 1930, Italy became the first European champions. On the train journey back home, having won the cup in Budapest, Pozzo dropped it, chipping off a small fragment. Prende questo piccolo frammento, eh, se lo accuratamente se lo, lo avvolge in ovatta e se lo mette in tasca. Porta la Coppa in Italia, nessuno sa di questo eh, scheggia che evidentemente era... Eh, quando racconta lui nel libro, eh, dice che questa scheggia se la mise in tasca e che la teneva come amuleto e dice non per niente mi ha portato anche fortuna in qualcosa che ho potuto credere, non per niente questa scheggia mi ha seguito nel campionato del mondo del 34, nel Olimpiadi del 36, nel campionato del mondo del 38. Italy's first national league kicked off in 1929 and Mussolini was often seen at matches, especially those involving Lazio. As Serie A grew in wealth and importance, it became home to numerous foreign stars, like the top scorer at the first World Cup in 1930, Guillermo Stavile from Argentina. Four months later, he made his debut in this match between Lazio and Genoa, one of just over a hundred foreigners to appear in the league in the 1930s. Some Argentines, Brazilians and Uruguayans of Italian descent even played for the national team. Football gave Mussolini a profile and he used it to good effect, though there is some debate as to how much he really liked the game. Mussolini fa sì eh, che si possa avere l'organizzazione eh, del campionato del mondo del 34. Non tanto per vincerlo, ma per far vedere che l'organizzazione era tale in Italia da poter organizzare un campionato del mondo. As they were not members of FIFA, England would not be there. The defeat of the English football 11, wearing white shirts, by Czechoslovakia in their first international in Prague for 35 years 
has caused critics much discussion on the question whether English soccer is as preeminent as it used to be. And the home side playing very precise football delight their supporters by shattering the legend of English supremacy. After this defeat a month before the finals, Potzer said the English would have progressed no further than the quarterfinals had they been in Italy. In the event, the 1934 World Cup was overshadowed by controversy, especially the alleged manipulation of referees by the hosts. Nowhere was this more evident than in the semi-final between Potzer's Italy and Meisel's Austria. Hugo Meisel, jo, náš hlavní šéf, nás upozornil, že se dozvěděl, to měli ty špiony asi nebo něco, že, 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 že se dozvěděl, že Mussolini, Mussolini pozval švédského rozhodčího toho a toho, který nám to bude pískat. Rozumíte tomu? Tak si dávejte pozor a my si dávali pozor. Ten nás tak podved, takový takový podvody, co dělal. Jo. Já si pamatuju na, na, na okamžik, že oni nám dali první gól a ty italský hráči z třech metrů ho, ho vzali, rozumíte, toho našeho a donesli ho až do gólu a on odpískal vlastní gól. The incident ended the friendship between Pozzo and Meisel. That goal also meant Italy were in the final where Eklund, the controversial Swedish referee, was again in charge, which did little to quell suspicious minds. Italy faced another of the Danubian school, Czechoslovakia. Having gone a goal behind, the Italians equalized with just nine minutes left. In extra time, Italy scored the winner after a handball by Miazza was ignored by the referee. Italy were world champions. Though on their return to Prague, the Czechoslovakian team received a tumultuous welcome. Za prvé, uh, ty hráči byli vítání ne jako poražení, ale jako morální mistři světa. Protože uh, tehdy také tisk o tom psal, že švédský rozhodčí finále naše mužstvo poškodil. Italian supporters rallied to Highbury to urge their men on to victory in the great international and the stands are packed with some 60,000 spectators and tremendous enthusiasm. Fainting already, it can't be the heat, so it must be excitement or, or spaghetti. Prince Arthur of Connaught with the bearded Signor Grandi shakes hands first with Arsenal, uh, sorry, England, wearing white shirts, then with the Italian team. In England, the World Cup had gone almost unnoticed. When the Italians came to London five months after winning the World Cup, it was billed as the match of the century. It later became known as the Battle of Highbury, as tempers flared. As early as the second minute, Italy were down to 10 men, through injury to Orsi. Three up in less than a quarter of an hour. A nasty shot for the team which is referred to as world soccer champions. The Italians fought back, and although they lost 3-2, it was now their turn to consider themselves moral winners. Well tried, Italy. Isolationism was very much the order of the day in England. The English saw little reason to question their superiority, despite the growing number of defeats experienced abroad. Herbert Chapman, manager of the Arsenal team, was one Englishman who did follow developments on the continent. Along with his friends Meisel and Pozzo, Chapman was the third of the great Napoleons of interwar football in Europe. He joined Arsenal in 1925, a club that had yet to win a trophy. Football between 1920 and 1930, by and large, was dominated by, by teams from the north, and specifically by Huddersfield Town. And then Herbert Chapman, who had already guided Huddersfield Town to three consecutive league championships, moved to Arsenal. And within five years, Chapman had taken Arsenal to the 1930 FA Cup final. And then the following year, they became the first London team to win a league championship. In 
In the 1930 FA Cup final, Chapman's two clubs came head to head as Arsenal played Huddersfield. Like Pozzo and Meisel, Chapman was an innovator. It was he who first pulled a third man into defence, and before the 1930 final even tried to sign a foreigner. But the transfer of Rudy Hayden, the goalkeeper of the Wonder Team, was blocked by the Ministry of Labour, one of the many hurdles Chapman faced in his career. Famous for the appearance of the Graf Zeppelin, the 1930 final saw Arsenal win the first of seven trophies. In a decade, they completely dominated. Here's Mr. Herbert Chapman, the famous manager with his lads at Highbury. And now I'm going to ask him to introduce them to you. Mr. Chapman? Uh, well, I must apologize this morning. I'm so husky, I can scarcely speak. La -de -da -de -da, la -de -da -de -da. All good pals and jolly good company. Hey! Oh! <laughs> Is that fine? In January 1934, Chapman died, age 58. It's not inconceivable to think of, of Herbert Chapman as uh, if he'd lived even another five or six years, possibly moving on from Arsenal to becoming an England manager. Chapman would have had uh, England in the World Cups the next night. You know, he understood football as an international game. He understood what we understand as modern football. Obviously, Arsenal lost a lot when Chapman died, but arguably English football lost a lot as well, particularly the England national team. In an increasingly professional game, the strict adherence to the amateur ethic meant isolation had also been the name of the game for Germany, the biggest nation in Europe, though in 1936, Berlin hosted the Olympic Games. Hijacked by the Nazis for their propaganda, the 1936 Olympics are remembered as one of the most political ever. The games left an indelible impression on those taking part. Ma atmosfera fredda. Però non c'è mai stato nessun eh, nessuno che avesse gridato qualcosa contro o che avesse fatto delle, piantato delle grandi, no? È stata era era un, un esercito, era tutto esercito. C'era Hitler, c'era. Sempre. Lei salutava così lui, eh? noi salutavamo così, lui salutava così. Comunque, certo però che i tedeschi sono gente dura, eh? Donna, donna. The World Cup was now the premier football tournament. But the final between Italy and an Austrian team coached by Jimmy Hogan still attracted huge interest. Italy's win, playing a strong physical game, was celebrated as much as their World Cup triumph. Ma è una strategia molto semplice, non tenere tanto la palla nei piedi, non, non uh, dribblare perché si rallenta il, il, il gioco, mentre invece con dei passaggi lunghi in profondità, sempre verso la porta avversaria, eh, potevano essere dei passaggi eh, che con un attaccante veloce si po potevano essere sfruttati fino in porta. Politics and nationalist sentiments ensured that club football maintained a high profile in Central Europe during the 1930s. Prague by then one of Europe's most fashionable capitals, remained a favoured destination as clubs competed for the best players on the continent. In 1938, thanks to the signing of Pepe Bitsan from Rapid Vienna, Slavia Prague won the Mitropa Cup.
No a pak mi dali obrovský plat, dvakrát tolik nebo třikrát skoro tolik, jak ve Vídni jsem měl. I když ve Vídni jsem měl velký plat poměrně, no ale, a, ale tady ta česká koruna, víte, jo, ta byla přeci hodnotná a úžasná. The last chapter in the evolving story of football during the interwar years was written in France at the finals of the 1938 World Cup. Absent again were England and Uruguay, along with the Austrians, whose players now represented Germany after the Anschluss of earlier in the year. With the death of Chapman in 1934 and Meisel in 1937, Pozzo was the undisputed master of European football. He could virtually do as he pleased. In più voleva sapere i fatti loro. Se io mando in campo uno che, che sta litigando con la moglie, io lo voglio sapere, perché se quello non è a posto di testa io non lo faccio giocare. Chi ha dei problemi di famiglia me lo dica, io voglio leggere la vostra posta. Come in guerra, no? quando c'è la censura, io voglio leggere la vostra posta. Sì, sì, accettavano, accettavano l'idea. Con questa tecnica, curatore d'anni me lo chiamavano, no? i giocatori. Con questa tecnica è arrivato ad avere una squadra assolutamente compatta, rendere tutti amici uno degli altri. Infatti c'è stato qualche giocatore che non ha giocato in nazionale perché c'era posto, eh, perché aveva fatto qualche cosa che non andava, o era venuto a conoscenza lui di qualche cosa che non aveva, o magari si era alzato di notte perché aveva adocchiato qualche signora o signorina nell'albergo. E... Noi eravamo come dei, dei prigionieri. Bei tempi. Italy reached the final where they faced Hungary. Having beaten the Czechs in the 1934 final and the Austrians in the 1936 Olympic final, here was a chance to vanquish the Danubian school, though they had to face a hostile reception from emigre Italians who had fled Mussolini's regime. Eppure abbiamo visto anche delle scene che hanno, ci hanno commosso, perché abbiamo visto di questi italiani che davano un principio, perché si vede che erano stati organizzati dal Partito Comunista francese per poter far saltare fuori qualche grana, rovinare qualche partita in modo che noi fossimo danneggiati là. Ecco. This was a much more polished Italian team than in 1934. And for their second goal, Italy gave the Hungarians a dose of their own medicine. Miazza passing when it was easier to score before Piola finished it off. Three major finals in the 1930s. Three opponents from the Danubian school. And the Italians had beaten them all. Gli italiani qualcuno, come ho visto io, che dopo piangeva, perché abbiamo vinto il campionato del mondo. Ma prima ci dicevano di tutti i colori, ce ne dicevano quando eravamo per la strada, che andavamo a fare delle passeggiate così tanto. Miazzo received the cup for Italy. Pozzo had achieved something no coach had managed to do before or has done since. Lead a team to two World Cup victories. In the decade of the dictators, Mussolini's Italy were the masters on the football field. War in Europe put a stop to the World Cup and Olympics, but remarkably, football carried on almost uninterrupted in most countries until the conflict reached its savage worst in 1944. If one thing had rankled the Italians in the 1930s, it was their inability to beat the English in the three matches they played. So when the England team arrived in Turin in May 1948, it was a chance for the Italians to see to some unfinished business. I felt that uh, we probably had one of the strongest squads that England have had for a, a great number of years, and uh, straight after the war, when people like Tommy Lawton, Ray Carter, Wilf Mannion and Stan Matthews, Tommy Lawton, uh, were playing, and um, the, the team more or less selected itself. 
At the age of 62, Pozzo was taking charge of his 95th and last international. Based on the remarkable Torino team that perished in a plane crash a year later, this was a talented Italian team, and they were still world champions. England, the pretenders to the throne, were slowly being drawn out of their self-imposed isolation and had even agreed to take part in the 1950 World Cup in Brazil. In the event, it was a remarkable match that reinforced the English belief that they were still the best team in the world. The 4-0 scoreline remains Italy's worst ever home defeat. Pozzo was sacked. He was a remarkable man in so many ways. But he was getting on to when we played them. He, I don't know how old he would be, but certainly been in the job a long time. And so they were ready to see a change. But a delightful man to meet and to talk to, very knowledgeable about the game. It was the end of a truly remarkable era. And now it's all aboard. About half a million pounds worth of soccer stars off to win the World Cup for England or bust the ball in the attempt. England's first World Cup adventure was an unmitigated disaster. Far from winning it, they didn't even get past the first round. Winterbottom may have been England's first coach, but his role was limited. When I looked upon those games, I thought, how stupid we are. We, it's typical, we're isolationists in every way. We don't see the need for preparation. Whether it was lack of preparation, bad luck, or just the skill of the Americans, the disaster of the 1-0 defeat against the United States was seen as symbolic by the rest of the world, but only as an aberration by the English. It was just one of those games that, uh, that when you, you, you play, and you could play them 99 times out of 100 and, and you know, probably win by four or five goals. I think we hit the woodwork on four or five instances in that particular game, and it was one of the, those games, the longer the game went, <laughs> you weren't going to win it. As England were being unceremoniously knocked out of the World Cup, a new and very different form of the Danubian school was rising to prominence behind the Iron Curtain in what was now termed Eastern Europe. Based around the players of the army side Honved, the legend of the Hungarian Arantxapat, or Golden Team, was beginning to take shape. At first, the Arantxapat were viewed with some suspicion in Western Europe. After all, they were communist and soldiers to boot. Valamiféle katonai kiképzésen estünk keresztül. Emlékszem, volt olyan eset, amikor kivittek bennünket egy lőtérre, ahol azt hiszem közülünk soha senki nem volt még, én se voltam, és ott különböző fegyverekkel kellett célba lőni, de aztán nagyon gyorsan abba hagyatták velünk ezt a gyakorlatot, mert a, körny a környék, a lőtér környéke veszélyeztetve volt. The first signs that the Hungarians were developing into a formidable team became apparent to the West during the 1952 Helsinki Olympics. In the final, they met Yugoslavia, and although the professional nations of the West were barred from sending their strongest teams, the manner in which the Hungarians won the title was still very impressive. Football was just one of 16 gold medals Hungary won in Helsinki. Hungary were placed third in the medals table behind the United States and the Soviet Union, a remarkable achievement for a country of just nine million people. Naturally, they received a hero's welcome on their return. And naturally, the politicians were quick to capitalize on the success of Helsinki. The political went from in the north side, the sport, mert azért 
hogy egy országot egy kormány képvisel, akár ilyen, akár olyan rendszerű. Tehát annak érdeke az, hogy a sport is olyan legyen, hogy az hát elősegítse az ő tevékenységüket. A nép állama öt esztendő alatt felépítette a magyar sport nagyszerű otthonát, a Népstadion. The most public manifestation of government backing for sport in Hungary came with the building of a huge new stadium in Budapest. In true communist fashion, it was called the Nep Stadium, the People Stadium. The fact that many of the Helsinki athletes also helped with the building at some stage only added to the attraction when it was opened in August 1953. ünnepségének kiemelkedő eseménye a budapesti bondvéd és a moszkvai Spartak mérkőzése. A két csapatkapitány, Puskás Ferenc és Szimonyan, valamint a két edző, Szokolov és Kalmár Jenő, zászlót és virágcsokrot cserél. The Arancsi Pat may have been building a reputation as the best national team in the world, but the Honved of Puskás and Co. were doing the same at club level. Hungarian football looks set to conquer the world. A viszony az egy kicsit egyoldalú volt. Mi kevésbé lelkesedtünk az akkori politikai helyzetért, mint ahogy a politika akkor lelkesedett a sport eredményekért. Gustav Sebes was the coaching inspiration behind the Arancsapat. It helped that he had so many world-class players in his team, but above all they were innovators. Players were given freedom to experiment, and within this group lay the genesis of the total football of the modern game. In November 1953, the Hungarians came to London to play England. There was huge interest in the match, not just in Hungary, but across the whole of Europe. England's 81 years of invincibility at home to foreign teams looked decidedly under threat. The Great Wembley match began with Wright winning the toss from Pushkash and an exchange of courtesies of a very friendly character, which is how it should be, of course. Inkább szerintem az angolok csináltak egy nagy propagandát, mert ők azt mondták, hogy a, a világ két legjobb csapata játszik egy, egymás ellen. Tehát minket felemeltek melléjük, saját maguk mellé. Perfect coordination led to a goal for Hungary in less than a minute. The scorer's name is pronounced Hidikuti, I hope. Olympic champions now started an absolute orgy of scoring. Their second came through Hitakuti. Their third was a real beauty. Just watch the smart footwork by Pushkach. So the match ended with England's first defeat at home by a foreign side, their heaviest defeat for 72 years. Six months later, the Hungarians made the most important train journey of their lives. After 16 years, the World Cup was returning to Europe. Hungary had reached the final the last time it had been held in Europe. This time, they were favorites to go one better. In their way stood a nation still reeling from the effects of war. It was ironic that when peace came to Germany, football stopped. During the war, it has continued almost uninterrupted. Amid the chaos and hardship, the championship did start again in 1948. With little other entertainment, football became hugely popular to a level not witnessed before in the country. Wie hier der frisch gebackene deutsche Fußballmeister VfB Stuttgart. Über 200.000 Begeisterte waren auf den Beinen, um ihre Meisterelf zu begrüßen und zu feiern. In 1950. Stuttgart was also the scene for West Germany's first ever international. Das Länderspiel habe ich mitgemacht gegen die Schweiz. Die Schweiz hat uns persönlich die Chance geboten. Wir haben hier Stuttgart gespielt vor 103.000 Zuschauer. Wir waren stolz und glücklich, dass sie bei uns eingeladen haben, dass die Schweiz uns die Chance geboten haben. Beim Anpfiff durch den englischen Schiedsrichter Ellis herrscht noch leicht das Lampenfieber. Aber schon kurz danach geht die deutsche Mannschaft mit Volldampf zum Angriff über. 
and within the first 10 seconds of their first game, West Germany almost scored. And now comes the entscheidende moment of the game. In highest danger, a Swiss defender hand. 11 meters. Radensky had got West Germany off to a winning start. Sepp Herberger had been appointed national team coach in 1936, a post he held for 28 years. No individual contributed more to the evolution of the game in Germany than Herberger. Ja, Herberger was an äh, so ein alter Fuchs. We had äh, immer gewusst, wo, wo, wo er den Hebel ansetzen musste und hat auch die, die Mannschaft aufeinander mit ein paar Worten hat er uns zusammengeschweißt, dass es gar keinen Zweifel gab, dass jeder für jeden da ist und jeder das Letzte gibt. It was against this background that Herberger took his team to Switzerland for the 1954 World Cup. At the start, no one gave them a chance. But by hook and by crook, they reached the final where they faced the Hungarians, unbeaten in 31 games stretching back four years. On the day of the final in Bern, it had been raining hard. It was the one thing that gave the Germans hope. They knew that man for man they were no match, but that the soggy pitch would make life difficult for their skillful opponents. The Hungarians had won the admiration of many in Western Europe, but there was a perception in the East that a communist country would not be allowed to win the World Cup. That left English referee Bill Ling with potentially the most difficult match of his life. Hungary raced into an early two-goal lead. But within 10 minutes, the Germans were back on level terms, though Grosic, a Hungarian goalkeeper, was clearly impeded as Germany equalised. There were no more goals until just before the end of a match the Hungarians dominated. It was the Germans, though, who made the breakthrough to lead 3-2. Ugye az az ominózus harmadik gól, amit a Puskás rúgott a befejezés előtt néhány perccel, amelyre mindenki esküdött, hogy nem volt les. Egyedül a játékvezető. Először érdekes módon, először nem, nem hogy mondjam, először gólt ítélt. Aztán valamilyen oknál fogva még egyszer fütyült és szabadrúgást ítélt a, a német csapat javára. Azzal a, a címmel, hogy, hogy les állás előzte meg a gólszerzést, a gól maga érvénytelen. Es war, äh, hat, war überhaupt keine Debatte. Die Ungarn haben das auch äh, anstandslos hingenommen. Die haben das selbst zugegeben, dass er drei Meter im Abseits stand, der Puschkas. Es gab keine Diskussion darüber. Germany's victory was the most unlikely outcome. But then the World Cup final was becoming noted for producing unlikely results and controversy. The Hungarians to this day believe they were not allowed to win that final. But it was a defeat taken with customary good grace. In Germany itself, disbelief combined with a national euphoria unknown since the war. It marked Germany's re-entry into the cultural mainstream of Europe and laid the foundations of football in success that made the nation one of the major European superpowers of the second half of the 20th century. For us, also for the whole world, they knew then suddenly over night where Deutschland lies. Before it was all so on the side. Und dann durch den, durch den Erfolg, dass wir Weltmeister wurden 1954, war das in der ganzen Welt wieder äh, bekannt, dass wo Deutschland liegt. So ahelyett, hogy mi egy megnyert világbajnokságról beszélhettünk volna a labdarúgást kedvelő, szerető emberekkel, a vereséget kellett meg, amit nem lehet megmagyarázni. Egy, a győzelmet nem kell megmagyarázni, a vereséget nem lehet megmagyarázni.
In the wake of the Hungarian uprising in 1956 and the crushing of it by the Soviets, most of Hungary's great players and coaches left for the West, where they continued to influence the development of modern football on every continent. That is the legacy of the Aranchipat. By the end of the 1950s, the European Champions Cup was being given a glorious baptism by Real Madrid. And the European Championship was beginning to shape the fixture lists of national teams. The landscape of European football was to change for good. <laughs> 